Five Get Into a Fix by Enid Blyton The four children were thinking that the Christmas holidays were the worst they'd ever had. George had come to stay with Julie and Dick and Anne, and all of them had gone down with awful colds and coughs. Timmy was the only one who didn't get ill. Anne went to the window. It had been snowing again, but not much. To think how they might have been out in it all last week had it not been for their colds. George joined her at the window. A car drew up outside, and a burly man got out and hurried up the steps to the front door. It was the doctor. In a minute or two, the door opened, and he came into the room with the mother of Julian, Dick and Anne. She looked tired, and no wonder. Looking after four ill children and a most miserable dog over Christmas had not been an easy job. The doctor suggested that what would do the most good would be to spend a week somewhere bracing, but not too cold, perhaps somewhere hilly where they could toboggan and ski. The children all thought it was a wonderful idea, but they couldn't think of where to go. Then, as so often happens, the problem was solved by somebody no one had thought of asking. Jenkins, the old man who helped in the garden, who came in carrying a basket of apples. He had an aunt who had a hillside farm in Wales, close to the sea. She let rooms in summer, but Jenkins didn't know whether she would in winter, because there would be nothing but snow there now. It sounded exactly what the children wanted. Everything was soon settled. Their mother agreed to telephone Mrs. Jones, Jenkins' aunt, and she seemed delighted to take the children. Two days later, everything was packed, including skis and toboggans, and they were off. They had a hired car with a cheerful, chatty driver, but it was a long drive, and the children fell asleep in the car. Then at long last, they were in Wales, with mountains beginning to loom up in the distance. We must be nearly there by now. You should think so. <coughs> <coughs> There's a signpost that says Kimri Lee or something. Oh, that's Welsh. It's pronounced cum really. Oh, I see. Well, shouldn't we be looking out for Magra Glen now? Yes, we must be getting on that way. I've been looking for a signpost myself. I wonder I haven't seen it yet. Goodness, I hope we haven't lost our way. It will soon be dark. <coughs> <coughs> Are you sure we're right? The road seems to be getting a bit rough. And we haven't passed a farmhouse for ages. Well, maybe we are on the wrong road, though where we took the wrong turning, I simply don't know. I reckon we're near the sea now. Look, there's a turning up to the right. It's got a signpost too. Doesn't say Magga Glen, though. It says Old Towers. Would that be a name of a place, do you think? Or a building? Where's a map? I haven't got one. I don't usually need one, but this countryside isn't signposted as it should be. Ah, oh, well, I guess we'd better turn right and go up to see this old towers. Maybe they can put us on the right road. What a steep road. It's quite a mountain, isn't it? <laughs> you can say that again. The old car's struggling to get up here, I can tell you. something. There's a building on the side of the hill. You can see it against the moon. It's got towers too. This must be it. There's a sign on the gate. <coughs> Keep out, it says. <laughs> well, that's nice and polite, isn't it? We only want to ask the way. I'll hop out and find someone. The gates are padlocked, but I could climb over. There's a light up ahead. Oh! Jump in. 
We'd better turn round and go, I think. Phew! <laughs> I'm glad we're this side of those gates. Shh, Timmy! That dog of yours is almost as bad. He's not! <laughs> well, you know what I mean. The people there must be jolly scared of burglars to have a dog like that. Yet it's such a lonely place. You wouldn't think many people would come near it. Well, I shan't be. You can count on that. <laughs> Let's go. It's funny. What is? Something wrong with the car. Seems very heavy to drive all of a sudden. As if I've got my brakes on. Perhaps you have. Well, I haven't. I should have going down this hill. I'm pushing the accelerator down hard now, and she still crawls. Now, what can be the matter? It really was a puzzle. Julian felt worried. He didn't want them to have to spend the night in the car, lost in the countryside, especially as it was now beginning to snow lightly. The moon had disappeared behind heavy clouds and everything looked very dark indeed. They reached the bottom of the hill at last and came onto level ground. Everyone was most relieved as the car sped along like a bird. They came to a signpost not long after that and the car slid to a stop beside it. Maga Glen, it said, and everyone gave a shout of delight. The driver swung his car into the lane it was obviously a farm road. And there, up the hill they were climbing, was a house. Ah, uh, this must be it. Oh no! More dogs! There's a woman come to the door. That must be Mrs Jones, Jenkins' aunt. Come in! Come in out of this cold and snow. Morgan will help you with the luggage. Come on, through here into the warm now. What a journey for you. <coughs> oh, there's a cough you've got. Never you worry. The air here will soon get rid of that, see if it doesn't. But now, it's supper you'll be wanting. Oh, yes, please. I'm sorry we're so late. We lost our way. This is my sister Anne, this is my cousin George, and this is my brother Dick. <laughs> and this is Timmy. Well now, there's good manners in a dog, holding his paw out like that. We've seven dogs, but not one of them would shake hands. No, not if the Queen herself came here. Yes, we heard. They're all outside, so don't you worry. Now then, go and wash while I make a pot of tea. Go through that door, look, and up the stairs. The rooms up there are all yours. Thank you, Mrs Jones. And after supper, I think if we may, we'd like to go straight to bed. It's been a long drive. That's a good idea. I've lit nice log fires in your rooms, so you'll keep lovely and warm. Then, tomorrow, you can get up when you like and just come into my kitchen when you're down. You can do just what you like here. The four children slept like logs all night long. If they coughed, they didn't know it. They lay in their beds, hardly moving, and only Timmy opened an eye occasionally, as he always did on the first night in a strange place. Julian awoke first in the morning. He heard the sounds of the farm coming through the closed window and looked at his watch. Good gracious, it was almost nine o'clock. He leapt out of bed and woke Dick and then went to wash. The bedroom was still warm with the burnt-out wood fires. The sun shone, but in the night the snow must have fallen heavily, for everywhere was white. The girls were already awake, for Timmy had heard the boys stirring and gone whining to the door. They all went downstairs and found the living room warm with a great wood fire. On the table was a big crusty loaf, butter and homemade marmalade, with an enormous jug of creamy milk. on top of this milk. Me for a farm life when I grow up. 
Timmy approves too. He's heard those other dogs outside. Well, you'll have to remember you're just a visitor, Timmy, when you meet them. No throwing your weight around. There they are, over by the barn. They look pretty big dogs. Welsh collies, I should think. I wonder what that dog was that barked so fiercely last night at Old Towers. Do you remember? How could we forget? It was like a nasty dream. Ah, here comes breakfast. Mrs. Jones, you've brought enough for eight people, not four. Oh, there! You're growing children, and this is one of mine, my son Morgan. Good morning. Morning. Morgan's not much of a one for talking, but the voice he's got when he's angry. I'm telling the truth when I say you could hear him a mile away. Here we are. Ham and eggs for you two girls. Put the boys' plates down there, Morgan. Those are Morgan's dogs. You can hear barking. Three of them there are. They go about with my Morgan everywhere, don't they, Morgan? Yeah. He's all for dogs. My Morgan is. Doesn't care much for people. He's got four more dogs on the hills with the sheep. And believe you me, if Morgan went out in the yard and shouted, those four dogs on the hills would hear him and come tearing down here like a flash of lightning. Anyway, you enjoy your breakfasts. Call me if you want anything. Come on, Morgan. He's huge, isn't he? Like a giant. Shh, they're coming back. Hello. Just popped in to say I'm off. Oh, it's you, driver. Did you stay the night then? Yes, the old lady gave me a bed in the barn. Never been so cosy in my life. And I say, I found out why the car crawled so slowly up and down that hill at Old Towers last night. Oh, have you? Why? Well, it wasn't anything to do with the car. It was to do with the hill. Whatever do you mean? The shepherd's wife told me they think there must be something magnetic under that hill, because when the postman goes up on his bicycle, the same thing happens. It feels like lead. So he leaves his bike at the bottom and walks up. I see. So the magnetic, whatever it is, got hold of the car last night. There must be some deposit of powerful metal in that hill. Does it affect all cars like that? Oh yes. No one goes up there in a car if they can help it. Funny thing, isn't it? Odd hill altogether, if you ask me. I wonder who lives there. Only an old lady. She's off her head, so they say. Won't let anyone in. Well. We know that, all right, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, must be pushing off now. You enjoy yourselves. We will. Thanks. Bye then. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. After breakfast, they wandered round the farm, enjoying the pale sun and the keen wind, and hardly coughed at all. George slipped the lead off Timmy's collar, and he ran off, sniffing here, there, and everywhere. He disappeared around a corner, his tongue hanging out happily. And then the most appalling barking began. The four rushed round the corner of the barn, and there was poor Timmy growling at three fierce dogs. George raced to Timmy and yelled at the dogs, but they took no notice of her. It was Timmy they wanted. Who was this strange dog who dared to come wandering round their home? Suddenly, Timmy gave a sharp yelp. He'd been bitten. Someone came rushing round the corner. It was Mrs. Jones. She called the dogs, but they took no notice of her either. And then, from somewhere, came a voice that echoed all round the farmhouse, as if it had come through a megaphone. Die! Bark! Tang! Thank God. That was Morgan. He must have heard the barking. Oh, my little dear, are you hurt? No, I don't know. I don't think so. It's Timmy that's hurt. Oh, Tim, where did they bite you? <coughs> His neck. Look, he's dripped blood on the snow. Let's see. Oh, it's not much, George. The other dog bit where his collar is. Look, his teeth went through the collar and not really into Tim's neck. Oh, but what a thing to happen! Why did you let him off the lead? You should have waited until Morgan had told his dogs your Timmy was a friend. I know it was all my fault. Oh, Timmy, I'm so thankful you've only got one small bite. Do you have any TCP, Mrs. Jones? I'll have some inside. Come away in. Timmy, oh my poor Timmy. He wouldn't mind having stuff dabbed on him all day long, George, if you'd only make a fuss of him. 
He might have been killed, and if those dogs get him again, he certainly will be. I'm going to go back home, not to your home, Jew, but to my own, Kieran Cottage. Oh, don't be silly, George. Anyone would think that Tim had been injured for life. He's only got a skin wound. Why spoil what may be a jolly good holiday just for that? I don't trust those dogs. They'll be out to get Tim now. I know they will. I tell you, I'm going home. George, listen. Stay one more day. It'll be difficult to make arrangements for you to go back today. Now that everywhere is under snow. All right. I'll stay till tomorrow. It will give Timmy a bit of time to get over his fright, but only till tomorrow. <laughs> well, after you've seen to Timmy, I vote we go for a walk. It's a shame to stick indoors on such a nice snowy day like this. Anne, are you coming? I will if George does. No, I'll stay with Tim this morning. You go off together. The boys left the two girls and went out into the invigorating mountain air. Already they felt better and were not coughing at all. What a pity this had happened! It had spoiled things for everyone. Mrs. Jones told them the best path to take for a walk up the mountain. She also gave them the key to her mountain chalet, where they could rest before coming back. Away they went, whistling. It was fun to have the day all to themselves. As they climbed higher, they could see the tops of more and more hills, all of which sparkled snowy white in the pale January sun. The view was magnificent. They were glad when they came at last to the chalet Mrs. Jones had spoken about. After two hours climbing, it was nice to think of having a good rest. Julian slipped the key into the lock, and they went inside. It was a fine little place indeed, with bunk beds, a stove, cupboards full of crockery, and tins of food. The two boys had the same idea at once. Couldn't we? What? Couldn't we stay here on our own? George would love it too. I'm sure she would. There's bedding, towels, crockery, cutlery, tins of food, everything we need. Do you think we'd be allowed to come up here instead of living down at the farm? Well, we can ask. But right now, I could do with something to eat, couldn't you? I'm ravenous. So am I. Let's have some of those biscuits. All right. I'm going to get a rug and wrap it round me. And sit down on the doorstep. That view is too marvellous for words. Yes, let's. Is that a house on the slope over there, near the top? I don't see how it can be. Besides, who would build a house so high up? Plenty of people. Not everyone likes towns and shops and traffic. I can imagine an artist building a house on one of those mountains just for the view. Who's that? What sort of artist do you mean? No, who's that coming down the path? Where? Oh yes, it's a small girl by the looks of it. She must be cold. She's only got a shirt and a pair of shorts on. And what's that with her? It's a dog and and a lamb. She's seen us. No, don't go. We shan't hurt you. Get some of those biscuits, Dick. Look. Biscuits for you and your dog. Oh no! It's the lamb that's coming over. Oh, hold on to it. Fanny, Fanny, come and get it. We shan't hurt you. Isn't she a funny little thing? What's your name? She doesn't seem to understand. What is your name? Me, Ailey. This die. Good dog, Di. Have another biscuit. And the lamb's called Fanny. I'm Julian. He's called Dick. Ah,、uh, my da. He up high. Sheep. Oh, your father's a shepherd. Di mine. Fanny mine. Me go now. What a funny little creature. We'll ask Mrs. Jones about her when we get back. My goodness! Come on, the sun's getting quite low. We've got to put the things away and lock up yet. Buck up! Once the sun goes, it'll be dark almost at once, and we've got a long way to go. It didn't take them long to tidy up and lock the little house. Then down the path they went at top speed. 
The boys felt exhilarated by their day on the mountainside and sang as they went all the way back to the farmhouse. They told the girls about their day, and when they described the little mountain chalet, the two girls listened eagerly. Then Julian told them of their idea of all five of them spending their time in the chalet instead of in the farmhouse. Anne agreed at once, and they all looked at George, who suddenly smiled and said that she would like that too. They put the idea to Mrs. Jones, who thought they would be most uncomfortable with no one to look after them and cook for them, but they insisted they were used to looking after themselves and would have a smashing time. Mrs. Jones still thought it was a funny idea, but said she would have a talk to her Morgan about it and let him decide. She went out of the room shaking her head, her mouth pursed up in disapproval. But Morgan said to let them go. He said they'd be safe enough, and with the snow coming, there'd be plenty of chance to use their toboggans. He also said he'd help them with their things. Now, are you sure you've got everything you'll be needing? Yes, thank you, Mrs Jones. We've got plenty. There's butter packed in with the loaves and a large pot of cream for you. I'll try and send up some more milk with the shepherd. He'll pass the hut sea when he goes up again. And you can always boil snow if you want to make tea, can't you? We'll be fine. I've packed some bones and dog biscuits for Timmy, too. Look. That's very kind of you. Oh, I just want to make sure you'll be all right. Ah, here's my Morgan now. He's brought his snow slide with him. You can put everything on that. Morning. Shall I take one of the ropes? Ha! <laughs> Strong as a horse, my Morgan. He'll pull it all easily. You see if he won't. Pile it all on. Here we are. It looks wonderful. It is. Oh, it's a proper little house inside. Quick, Julian, where's the key? Morgan's got it. Thanks so much for helping bring up our things. Shepherd comes by at times. He'll take messages for you if you want. I'll leave you now. He's peculiar. I don't know whether I like him or not. What does it matter? Come on, there's plenty to do. What about you and George seeing what blankets and things are in those cupboards? Right. Yes. There's plenty of everything here. The stove looks as if it's full too. Good. We'll light it tonight. Let's get packed away and then we can go out. Do you want something to eat before we go? Or shall we have a meal when we get back? Oh, let's just take some sandwiches. I wonder if Tim will like travelling downhill on a toboggan, George. Oh, he'll love it, I bet. Dick took George on his toboggan and Julian took Anne on his. Timmy was terribly excited. He came plunging down the hillside after the toboggans, barking madly. The four children soon had glowing faces and tingling limbs and wished they could throw off their coats and scarves. After a while, they decided they'd had enough and sat down at the top of the slope, eating their sandwiches. They were glad of the rest. Pity Mother can't see us now. Nobody's coughed once. I bet we'll be stiff tomorrow, though. I will, I know that. What about you, Dick? What? Sorry, I didn't hear you. I said pity Mother can't see us now, without our coughs. What are you looking at? Over there. The building I thought I saw yesterday, on the opposite hill. Isn't that a chimney sticking up? You've got sharp eyes. Nobody could see a building that far away when the snow's on it. Wait a minute. I've got my binoculars. Here, take a look, Dick. Yes, I was right. It is a building, and I'm pretty sure it must be old towers, too. Let's see. Here. Yes, that's the place. I caught a glimpse of the towers on the way up the hill. <coughs> what is it, boy? There's someone coming. It's a woman. I wonder what she wants. We'll soon find out. Hello, can we help you? Good day. You'll be the boys my Ailey was telling me of last night. You're Ailey's mother? That I am. 
And you are staying in the Joneses' hut then, are you? Yes. We were staying at the farm first, but now we've come up here. Well, if you see that Ailey of mine, tell her not to stay out tonight. Her and her lamb. She's as mad as the old lady over there in Old Towers. Oh, do you know anything about that old place? We went to it by mistake and... You didn't get into it, I'll be bound. And to think I used to go up there three times a week and never anything but kindness shown me. And now old Mrs Thomas, she won't see a soul. Poor old lady. She's out of her mind, they say. Why do they have such a fierce dog there, though? Ah, well, young man, some of the old lady's friends would like to know what's going on, too. But nobody can do a thing. It's a strange place now, with noises at night and mists and shimmerings and... Oh, you may smile, young man, but ever since last October there have been strange goings on there. And what's more, vans have been there in the dead of night. What for, I'd like to know? If you ask me, I reckon they've been taking away the poor old thing's belongings, furniture and pictures and things. Poor Mrs Thomas... She was sweet and kind, and now I don't know what's happened to her. Oh, now look, I shouldn't be telling you all this. You'll be scared sleeping alone at night. No, no we shan't. Honest. Do tell us about Hayley, though. Isn't she frozen going about with just shorts and a shirt on? Oh, that child, she's a one. Runs about the hills like a wild thing. Plays truant from school. Goes to see her father. He's a shepherd. Doesn't come home at nights. You tell her there's a good scolding waiting for her at home if she doesn't come back tonight. Well, if we see her, we'll certainly tell her to go home. But not about the scolding, because I expect she wouldn't go home then. As you like. Well, I'll be off now. Enjoy yourselves. And don't be scared about what I said. We won't. Bye. Bye. It was getting dark by now, and the four went inside. Dick suggested they play a game of cards, so they all sat down to play Snap. But soon Dick's cards had all been snapped by the others. He yawned and went to the window, looking out into the darkness that hid all the snowy hills. Then he stood tense for a moment, staring in surprise. On the opposite hill, where Old Towers was, the air was shimmering. It seemed to be all the colours of a rainbow, rising high into the sky and then disappearing. He called to the others, but by the time they rushed to join him, it had gone. They all gazed towards the opposite hill, hoping something would happen, but nothing did. The sky was pitch black, for heavy clouds had come up, and the distant hill couldn't be seen. They played some more cards after that, then had a meal. Finally, they decided it was time for bed. One by one, they fell asleep. The oil stove burned steadily. It was turned low, and shadows quivered on the ceiling and walls. And then something made Timmy's ears prick up as he lay asleep at George's feet. Timmy sat up straight and growled in his throat. Then he barked sharply. Shh! What's the matter, Tim? What? What's up, George? Something's disturbed Tim. Must be someone prowling around outside. Wait, I think I heard something. What is it, Anne? There! Can you hear it? No. Yes. What is it? What's happening now? The whole place is shuddering. It's as if as we were shivering in every part of us. Sort of vibrating as if we had a tiny dynamo engine working inside us. Yes, you've described it exactly. It's just like putting my hand on something working by electricity. You know the sort of vibrations you feel then. It's gone. It's not shuddering anymore. And I can't hear that grumbling noise now. Can you? No. How strange it stopped like that. It must be something to do with that curious shimmering I saw in the sky over Old Tara's Hill earlier. Let's have a look. Look! Look, everybody! Phew! Come and look! What is it? It's like a glowing mist, swirling over the hill. What a strange colour! Not red, not yellow, not orange. 
What colour is it? I call this jolly strange. No wonder Ellie's mother told us those stories. It's funny that both the shimmering and that cloud are over Old Towers Hill. You don't think it's something that's happening in Old Towers House, do you? No, of course not. What could happen there that would make us feel the effects here? They awoke late the next morning, for they'd been tired out with their exertions the day before. Julian leapt out of his bunk when he found out it was ten to nine and dressed quickly. He went out to get some snow to put into the kettle. Soon breakfast was ready, and they were all eating and chattering, talking over the happenings of the night. And as they sat round the table, Timmy ran to the door and began to bark. Then a face looked in at the window. It was a remarkable face, old and wrinkled, yet curiously young-looking too. The eyes were as blue as a summer's day. It was a man's face with a long, raggedy beard and a moustache. Gracious, he looks like one of the old prophets out of the Bible. Who is he? The shepherd, I expect. We'll ask him in for a cup of cocoa. Maybe he can answer a few questions for us. Are you the shepherd? Come in. We're having breakfast. You can have some too if you like. You are kind. You want to send words to the farm? Oh yes, please. Take a message to the farm. Just say we're fine. All is well. All is well. All is well. That's right. Here, have some bread and cheese. No, I won't eat now. I, I would like a drink, please. This morning is cold. I'll get it. Thank you. Shepherd, did you by any chance hear curious noises last night? And did you see a coloured mist over the hill there? It has always been a strange hill, that one. My granddad told me a, a big dog lay below, growling for food. Here's your cocoa. Thank you. We heard the big dog growling last night. Ah, yes, but the dog is worse now. More evil, more wicked. More wicked? How? I'm not clever. I, I know few things. My sheep and the wind and the sky. But I know that the hill is wicked. You must not go near it, young ones. For there the plough will not plough. The spade will not dig. What do you mean? I go and take your words to Mrs. Jones now. And thank you for your kindness. Good day. Well, what a character. And what did he mean about ploughs not ploughing? Well, it may be that in the old days, ploughs went too heavily and too slowly to plough properly. Remember how our car wouldn't go down the hill fast? And Ailey's mother said the postman had to leave his bike at the bottom of the hill. But why? Surely you don't believe these things. Anne doesn't want to believe. Come on, let's forget the weird happenings last night and get out our skis. A bit of skiing will do us good. Timmy didn't find skiing any fun at all. He couldn't keep up with the others when they tore down the hill at top speed. The four children had all skied before and were quite good at it. The hill down which they went was very long and had a fine slope. It ran smoothly into the upward slope of the next hill on which Old Tower's house had been built. I say, what about going to the top of this hill and skiing down and partly up our own slope again? It would give us a jolly good second ski run. I'm not sure I want to. She's scared of going up Old Towers Hill. Are you afraid of the big, big dog who lies under it and growls in the night, Anne? <laughs> Don't be silly. Well, come on then. I'm coming. Look. You can 
see old towers quite clearly now. I wonder if that old lady is still there. Mrs. Thomas. The one Ailey's mother used to work for. Poor old thing. I'm sorry for her if she is. Almost at the top now. We'll wait for the others, then have a race. Julian, look! What? Is that someone at one of the tower windows? The one on the right? Where? Oh, I see. Yes. Yes, it looks like... Hey! You kids! Get off this slope! We're only skiing. I don't care. This field belongs to the house, and I'm the caretaker, so keep off it. We'll ask permission from the owner, then. No, you won't. There's no one here but me. Now be off with you, or I'll set my dog on you. Let's go, George. The children were puzzled. Why should it matter if they skied down that particular slope? And why did the caretaker tell a lie and say there was no one else there when they'd seen someone in the tower window? They went back to the chalet, and there, standing in the snow outside it, were two quarts of milk and a large parcel with cold roast pork in it that the shepherd had brought up for them. They had just finished their meal when Ailey appeared at the window with her lamb. She wasn't shy this time, and didn't run away when Julian opened the door. Anne offered the untidy little girl some of the meat, but she shook her head and pointed to the cheese. She looked on in delight as Anne cut her a generous piece and sat down on the floor to eat it. Costa! What's she say? I think she's saying the cheese is good. Where did you sleep last night, Ailey? Your mother was looking for you. In hay, at Mother Farm. Ailey, listen. Who lives at Old Towers? Many people. Big dog. More big than him. Anyone else? Old lady. She threw me paper out of window. What do you mean, paper? Paper with words on it. What's it say? Ailey not know. She can't read. Never mind, Ailey. We'll read it for you. Do you have the paper? Here. I am a prisoner here in my own house. They have killed my son. Help me. Bronwyn Thomas. Good gracious. Should we show it to the police? How do we know it's true? The old lady might be off her head, as they say. How can we find out whether it's true or not, then? Ailey. We want to see the old lady. Will you show us the way into the grounds? No. Big dog. Big teeth. Ellie, show the way into house. Into the house? But you'd have to go through the grounds first. No. Ellie, show you. Is that Ellie in there? Come on out, my girl. It's your mother, Ellie. Ellie, not want to go. I'm afraid you'll have to. I'm taking Ailey home. I'll scold her well. No, no. Poor Ailey. She'll be all right. What do we do now? I think we'd better go down to the farm and tell Morgan what we know. If this old lady really is a prisoner, I don't see how we can do a thing. But he might be able to. Come on, let's go down now. We can stay at the farm if it gets dark. George did not particularly want to go down to the farm, as she was afraid of Timmy meeting the farm dogs again. Anne offered to stay with her, so the two boys set off together down the winding mountain path. Morgan was in the old barn. His three dogs at once ran out when they heard strange footsteps, but they recognized the boys at once and leapt around barking at them. The giant-like Morgan came out to see what the dogs were barking about. He was surprised to find the two boys there fondling the dogs. Julian told him his story. He told him about the rumbling noises, the shimmering in the sky, and the shuddering. Then he told him about the old woman they had seen in the tower, and how Ailey had given them the piece of paper which said Mrs. Thomas was a prisoner in her own house. And where is this paper? Here. Hmm. I see. Well, I'll hold on to this. I'd rather like it back. 
Unless you want to show it to the police. You leave it to me. This matter is not for children. You must go back to the hut and forget all you have heard and seen. And if Ailey comes, bring her down here to me and I'll talk to her. But Morgan, aren't you going to do anything about this? Go to the police or... I have told you. This is not a matter for children. If you are not willing to go back to the hut and say nothing, you will go home tomorrow. Well, what do you make of that? Come on, let's get back to the hut. But I can't make it out, you. Why was he so annoyed about it all? Well, if you ask me, I think he knows much more than we were able to tell him. There's some kind of racket going on at Old Towers, and Morgan is in it. That's why he told us not to interfere. Julian, what do you think is going on at Old Towers? I mean, it isn't only a question of locking up an old lady in a tower and selling her goods and taking the money. It's all the other things too. The shudderings and that strange mist. Well, apparently those things have been going on for some time. They may have had nothing to do with what Morgan is mixed up in, which is, I'm sure, to do with robbing the old lady. In fact... Those old tales may be a very good way of keeping people away from the place. It sounds very convincing when you put it like that. But somehow, I don't feel convinced. I can't help feeling there's something we don't know. When Julian and Dick got back to the chalet, the four children sat and talked for a long time. What would be the best thing to do? And how would they even begin to do anything? For one thing, they didn't know how to get into the house. No one was going to risk a battle with that fierce dog. At that moment, Timmy suddenly began to bark. Now what was up? George went to the door and was about to open it when she heard another dog barking, just beyond the hut. There was Morgan. He passed by the window and they saw his great shoulders and head bent against the wind as he went up the hill towards where the shepherd lived. The children felt uncomfortable about Ailey. Probably Morgan had gone up to the shepherd to complain about her. None of them felt like playing cards just then. They sat and talked, wondering if they would hear Morgan coming back. They knew Timmy would bark if he did. Sure enough, he began to bark about half past eight and made them all jump. They all watched for Morgan's head to pass the window again, but it didn't. Neither did any dog bark outside. Then George saw that Timmy was sitting with his ears pricked up and his head on one side. What could he hear? The countryside seemed to be absolutely quiet at that moment. Suddenly he ran to the door and whined, scraping at it with his paw. What's up, Timmy? Shall we open the door, Julian? I'll go. Ailey! What on earth? What are you doing here? You look frozen. Come in. Come into the warm. I'll make some hot cocoa. Poor little thing. What made her come all this way so late at night? She must have gone home with her mother and probably got a good telling off. And then my guess is that Morgan went down to see if she was there and to scold her. Morgan! No! No! It's all right. We'll look after you. Morgan shan't get you. See, I bet I'm right. It was he who went and scared her. I expect she escaped from her mother's house and came up here to hide. That horrible fellow. If he shouted at her as he shouted at us, she'd be scared stiff. <coughs> that may be Morgan coming back. Hide, Ailey, for goodness sake. Up into the top bunk, Ailey. Quick, I'll cover you with the rug. Just lie still. I'm going to lock the door. I'm not having Morgan in here hunting for Ailey. I can hear those dogs of his now, Julian. For goodness sake, don't let them in here. I know. Let's sit around a table and pretend to be playing a game. Then if Morgan looks in, he'll think everything is normal. He won't guess we've got Ailey here. Good idea, Dick. Come on, everyone. Now, if I suddenly say, what ho, you know I can see Morgan at the window and you must play like anything. See? Snap! I say don't grab like that. Snap! Snap! I said it first. What ho? Snap! Where is he? He's gone.
drawn from the window now. But go on playing. You may come to the door. Who's there? Morgan, let me in. No, we've got our dog here, and we don't want him set on again. Well, if you see Ailey, send her home. She's gone again and her mum's worried. Right. If she comes, we'll give her a bed here. No, no, you, you send her home. And pay heed to what I told you down at the barn. Or it'll be the worse for all of us. For all of us? I like that. It will certainly be the worst for him and his friend when the secret's out. Has he gone, Tim? <coughs> I can hear his dogs in the distance. We can get Ailey down now. Ailey, Morgan is gone. Come down and have a meal. Ailey, thank you for saving from Morgan. Ailey, tell how to get into Big House now. You'll tell us? Big, big hole. Down, down, down. Where's this big hole? Ailey, tell you. No, Ailey, show. Come. No, not now. Not in the snow and dark. Tomorrow. Show us in the morning. Not now. In the morning, yes. Ailey, show in the morning. Next morning, everyone was awake early. They had slept well and were excited to think that an adventure lay ahead. To get into that old house with its many secrets would be marvellous. They set off at last. The snow was still falling, and Julian felt seriously doubtful whether they'd be able to find their way down the hill and up the other slope. The toboggans were rather crowded. Julian and Dick were on the first one, with Ailey and her lamb between them, and Anne and George were on the second one, with Timmy and Ailey's dog Di between them. Whoosh went the toboggans, down the slope to the bottom and up the opposite slope. The snowflakes were quite big now, and nothing that was more than a few yards away could be seen. Ailey stood there, her feet sinking into the snow. She looked all round, and Julian felt certain that she was going to say that she didn't know which way to go in this thick snow. Even he was rather doubtful of which was the way back up the hill. But Ailey was like a dog. She had a sure sense of direction, and could go from one place to another on a dark night or in the snow without any difficulty at all. They all set off up the rest of the slope of Old Towers Hill. Then Ailey gave a call and pointed to the right. In about a minute, Ailey suddenly leapt off the toboggan and stood there looking around with a frown. Then she began to scrape down through the snow. Timmy obligingly went to help her, imagining that she was after rabbits or a hidden hare. Timmy! You take Timmy. He'll fall down, down like die one day. I say, I believe she's looking for an old pothole. Hole. See? Big, big hole. Ali, find for you. She has to. Well, certainly you found your hole. But how does it get us into old towers? Go down. Yes. Ali, show the way. Well, we'd better go down if it's possible. See? Ailey's lamb knows the way. She's jumped into the hole. Here, wait, Ailey. You can't jump too. You'll hurt yourself. Ailey, here. You come quick. Julian, shine your torch down. It's a pretty good drop. I know. Pull the toboggans over the hole and let their ropes hang down into it. Then we can climb down safely. Disappeared. Wait a minute. A tunnel. Hurry up, everyone. I bet we're heading for old towers. This tunnel probably goes right under the fence and the ground and comes up by the house. But where's Ailey got to? I don't know. Ailey, where are you? There she is. This way? We must be under the house now. I wonder if... Cellars! We're in the cellars. Look, the wall over there has been knocked down. Let's investigate. No, no, not go there. Bad men, very bad men. We have to see Ailey. Wait, what's that noise? It's a river. There's an underground river the other side of this wall. 
I bet it's flowing down through the mountain to the sea. Bad men down there. Bang, bang. Big fires. Big noise. Come into the house quick. Gosh, this is extraordinary. What is going on here? We really shall have to find out. Let's leave it for now, Jew. Come back and let's go into the house, as Ailey says. Ailey led them all unerringly back through the smashed walls, the musty cellars, and into some that looked as if they had recently been used as store places. They followed her up a long flight of stone cellar steps, through a great door, and into a perfectly enormous kitchen. Then she led them to a great hall, from which two wide stairways swept up, meeting above at an even wider landing. Ailey seemed quite at home in the house, and Dick wondered how many times she had let herself down into the pothole and come wandering in here. No wonder she spent so many nights away from home. She could always hide away in some corner of this big house. They followed her up the wide stairs, but Ailey would come no farther than the second floor. Now before them stretched a great picture gallery that led to another stairway at the far end. Ailey hung back and pointed to the pictures, each a portrait of some long dead owner of the house. Ailey was afraid of these portraits with their eyes, which appeared to follow her wherever she went. The four children and Timmy left Ailey curled up behind a curtain, with Di her dog and Fanny the lamb and went softly along the gallery and up the stairs. Now they were in a long passage that ran from tower room to tower room. Which was the tower they wanted? It was very easy to find out. All of them had their doors open, but one. This must be it. Who knocks? Surely not you, Matthew. You have no manners. Unlock the door. And do not mock me with your knocking. The key's in the door. Unlock it, Julian, quick. And why have you come at this time in the morning, Matthew? It isn't Matthew, it's us. We've come to set you free. Who are you? Let me out of that door before Matthew comes. Let me out. Are those men here still? I feel faint. Oh. Get me some water. I will. Here you are. Oh. But who are you? Oh, I must be going mad. Mrs. Thomas? You are Mrs. Thomas, aren't you? Little Ailey, the shepherd's daughter, brought us here. She knew you were locked up. But what has Ailey to do with this? It's another trick. Where are the men who killed my son? Those men that my Llewellyn brought here. They wanted to buy my house, but I wouldn't sell it. No, I wouldn't. Do you know what they said to me? They said that in this hill, far below my house, was a rare metal. A powerful metal worth a fortune. Oh, what did they call it now? We don't... Why should you know about it? You are only children. But I wouldn't sell it. No, not my house, nor the metal below it. So they asked my son, and he said no as I had. Then they took him away and killed him. And now they are at work below. Yes, yes, I hear them. I feel my house shake. But who are you? And where is Matthew? He keeps me locked in my room. He told me about Llewellyn, my poor dead son. He is a wicked man, a wicked man. <laughs> well, well, we'll leave you now, Mrs. Thomas, and send someone soon to bring you out of here. What do you think you're doing, Julian, locking that poor old thing up again? Are we going to take her with us? No, how can we? We must go to the police. In the meantime, I honestly think she'll be safer in that room than anywhere else. Come on, let's find Ailey. You back? Yes, we found Mrs. Thomas. She's locked in her room. Man down there locked in too. He's very cross. What man, Ailey? Don't know. Ailey see him.
in my sleeping room. Close the door. Lock it. He awake now. Shout and bang. Matthew. I bet it's Matthew. Let me out. Let me out, I say. Matthew. Who's out there? Who is that? If it's one of you men, you'll be sorry for it. Matthew, this isn't one of the men. We've come to rescue Mrs. Thomas. And now we're going to the police to report all this. And to report that her son has been killed by the men working below this house. Ha! The police can't do anything. Lowell in the sun isn't dead. He's alive and kicking. Now he won't be pleased with you, whoever you are. So why did you tell Mrs. Thomas he was dead? What's that to you? Llewellyn told me to tell his mother that. The old lady wouldn't let him sell that stuff deep under the house, that's why. Now who are you? Whoever you are, you let me out. You hear me? You let me out! He sounds a bit mad. Best to leave him locked up, I'd say. We'd better get to the police as soon as we can. Come on, we'll go back the way we came. Ignoring Matthew's yells and bangs, the children made their way through the kitchen and down the cellar steps, flashing their torches to light their way. They came to where the wall had been knocked down to get to the river and stood there listening to the gurgling water. Suddenly, Fanny the lamb skipped off and down the river tunnel. Ailey ran after her, as sure-footed as the lamb, hopping and skipping over the rough, rocky bank of the river. George was terrified that Ailey would fall in, in the blackness of the tunnel, and sent Timmy after her. But when, after five minutes, no one had come back, George started forward, flashing her torch on the rocky path beside the river. And she was gone before the boys could get hold of her. Julian, Dick and Anne had no alternative but to follow. It seemed like a bad dream to the four children, making their way over the rocky edge of the underground river. Quite suddenly, the tunnel widened tremendously, the river making a big, broad pool before it tore on down the tunnel again. The walls opened up into an enormous cave, half of which was water and the other half a stretch of rough, rocky floor. George was most astonished. She was even more astonished at other things she saw. Rafts! I wonder what they're for. Funny, there doesn't seem to be anybody around. <laughs> Timmy, there you are at last. Have you found Ailey? Ailey over here? Thank goodness. Here come the others now. Isn't this amazing? I see what the idea is. Jolly clever too. They're mining that precious metal down here somewhere and putting it on those rafts there so that the underground river can take it straight down to the sea. I bet they've got barges or something waiting to take the stuff away at night. Phew! Ingenious! And they count on the strange noises and shudderings to keep people away. Voices! Where? Quick, everyone! Behind this crate! Can you see anything, Dick? Yes. Two men walking up the tunnel from the direction of the sea. One is Morgan. Let's see. Who's the other? No, it's the shepherd. Ailey's father. Would you believe it? We always thought Morgan was mixed up in this, but... The rumbling! But oh, doesn't it sound near? It's got right inside my head! Let's follow Morgan and the shepherd. We can keep well in the shadows, and they won't hear us above this noise. You stay here, Ailey. Ailey, wait. Good. Right, let's see where they go. This tunnel seems to be lit, but I can't see any lights. I think it's the reflection of some great glare far below. Let's see. That's the end of the tunnel down there. We're coming to the works, I bet. The mine where that strange metal is. Let's see. What's happened now? The rumbling stopped. Look how light it is. See that glow? It's the same shimmering light I saw the other night. It's like a dream. Where are Morgan and the shepherd now? Look, there they are in that corner. Oh no, they're coming this way. We'd better get back. Quick! I can hear someone coming out the tunnel. Where's Ailey now? We don't leave her here. Look out, it's Morgan! What are you doing here? 
Come with us, quickly. You're in danger. Do what he says, children. Haley, what are you doing here? She's with us. I told you not to interfere. I was handling this fool of a boy. Quick, we must hide and hope the men will think that we've gone down the tunnel. Now just stay there, behind those crates, all you kids. We will do what we can. Julian, we've made fools of ourselves. Morgan was trying to find out the secret of old towers himself, with the help of the shepherd. No wonder he was angry when he thought we were meddling in such a serious matter. Where's Morgan now? Can you see him? No, but I can see the men. The first one looks pretty grim. He's got an iron bar in his hand. The men came out cautiously, not sure how many people they were after. They advanced across the cave, seven of them, all with weapons of some sort. Two went up the upper river tunnel, two down the other one that led to the sea, and the others began to hunt among the crates. They found the children first. It was Ailey's fault. She gave a sudden scream of fright. The men pulled away the crates and found themselves looking at five children. But not for long. With a terrifying bark, Timmy flung himself on the first man. Then Morgan appeared and surprised another of the men. But there were too many of them, and more were now coming up from the tunnel at the back of the cave. The shepherd was soon overpowered and his hands bound behind his back. Morgan fought for some time, but then had to surrender. He was like an angry bull, roaring with rage as three men tied his hands. The boss of the men came up and faced him. You'll be sorry for this, Morgan. All our lives we've been enemies, you down at the farm and me here at Old Towers. Where is your old mother? A prisoner in her own house, and who has robbed her? You, Llewellyn Thomas! Ha! What do I care? You men, take those kids over there and bring him to. You fool, Morgan. If you think you can get along that tunnel with your hands tied, no, don't go after him. He'll fall into the river. And without his hands to help him, he'll drown. Serve him right. I'm not planning to escape, Llewellyn Thomas. Guy, Bob, Tang, come to me. Doon, Joel, right. Ball! He's calling his dogs. He's calling his dogs. Die, Bob, Tang, Doon, John, Rafe, and Hall! At the last name, Morgan's voice began to crack. The shepherd raised his head in dismay. Morgan had overstrained that great voice of his. There was silence after that. Morgan called no more. The children felt scared and depressed, and Ailey began to whimper. The curious shuddering began to creep into everything again, and the boss turned sharply, giving some more orders. Then things took on a curious shimmer, as if a heat haze had spread everywhere. Suddenly, something happened. At first, it sounded far off in the distance, a confused noise that made Timmy prick his ears. He barked and the man holding him hit him. Now the sound grew louder and louder. It was the barking of seven angry dogs. Morgan's voice had echoed all the way down the tunnel and been heard by the sharp ears of the dogs who loved him. Then, to the men's horror, the seven dogs raced out of the tunnel at great speed, barking, growling, snarling, with a triumphant Morgan behind them. The men fled, every one of them. Llewellyn had turned to run even before the dogs appeared and was gone. Di leapt at one man and got him down, and Tang leapt at another. The cave was filled with snarls and growls and excited barking. Timmy delightedly joined in, for his captor had rushed away, while the children stood amazed and thankful to see their enemy defeated. Morgan would not let the children stay underground any longer. He told them to go back to the farm and telephone the police, to say, Morgan has won. They would know what he meant. I vote we stay here at the farm tonight. I feel tired out after such an adventure, don't you? I do a bit. And I suppose there won't be so much shuddering and shimmering and rumbling now. I wonder when Morgan will be back. That's him now, I think. And the shepherd. 
Come on through. Hello, everybody. Morgan? Yes? We want to apologise for being such idiots. We shouldn't have interfered after what you said. Oh, forget it, boy. All's well now. The police came up the river tunnel and all the men are safe in jail. Llewellyn Thomas is a sad man tonight. His mother is free and staying with friends, poor lady. She doesn't understand what has happened and that is as well. And maybe now the right people will get that strange metal. It's worth a hundred times its weight in gold. Come in for your supper, Morgenbach. And you, Shepherd. The children are eating with us too. We have a roasting turkey. It's your birthday, Morgan boy. Oh, well, there now. I didn't know it. Oh, let's go into that turkey. I've had nothing all day. What an enormous turkey. Oh, plenty for everyone. I know who deserves some of this. Dai Tang Dun Riff Jol Hal. He's calling the dogs. Just as he called them up the tunnel. Well, they certainly deserve a good dinner. Here, boys. <laughs> Shh, Timmy. Here, Timmy. You did well too. Catch! Oh, there'll not be much left of your birthday turkey. Now, fill your glasses again, children, and we will drink to my Morgan. A better son than never was. Happy birthday, Morgan, and may your voice never grow less. Happy birthday!